So thank you all for joining us this morning uh, during our summer for a session on aligning grading with quality teaching and learning. So my name is Jen McCray and I am the science coordinator here at the campus. Um, and as a teacher, I developed um, a standards-based grading system for my high school science courses. And then it, and later actually helped a couple of schools transition their grading systems to a fully standards-based mastery um, learning model. So that's my interest in uh, grading and aligning it to teaching and learning. And I'll hand it over to Marty for his introduction. I'm trying to get it so I see all the faces again here. All I'm seeing is myself. There's more, okay. So my name is Marty Krovitz. I was a high school math teacher, high school principal for 14 years, a professor of educational leadership at San Jose State for 15 years. And then for the last 15 years, any of you who are familiar with, the, with Ted Sizer and the Coalition of Essential Schools, I'm the director of the LEAD Center, which is the regional center that does the coalition work in this area. Hi, I'm Christine Chopra. I'm the executive director for the Santa Cruz County College and Career Collaborative. I have been a high school teacher. I've worked in college access work for many years in Washington, and I have now I've taught at UC Santa Cruz and CSUMB in educational leadership. And in my role currently, I do college access work again. And I've been working with some really great administrators and Marty to start thinking about our grading practices in the county. So I just wanted to um, talk about a few norms. I know that everyone's a Zoom expert by now, but and now I have a map flying in front of me. <laughs> so please mute unless you're speaking. If you could rename your picture with your district or school, that would be helpful. We would like for you to use chat for your comments. And if there's any way you could hold some of your questions though until the end, that would be great. So I can sort of group them thematically and that none of them get lost in the chat box. And um, I know that it's early in the morning, but if you can possibly use your video, I think that that's important because Zoom has been somewhat impersonal and so it's great to be able to see people. Uh, the meeting's being recorded and the links to the documents will be shared. There is a sign-in sheet, which will be great to help us um, follow up with people who want more resources. So I'll post that in the chat again for those that are still coming. Great, so this morning we're gonna start out with um, a connector, but the bulk of our work is going to be around the guiding questions for PLCs around grading. I'm gonna talk a little bit about question zero. I'll keep that uh, under my hat for now. Look at some expert recommendations and a, quite a bit of time for question and answer. We plan for about 20 minutes for that portion. So hopefully you've got some great questions for us and then we'll look a little bit at what next steps might be. So for our connector, we're going to do a Menti. So you'll need to go to menti.com. And there's a code there. And I'll have Christine drop the code and the link into the chat for us. And let's just put up. So what's working well? Right now. Sorry, my connection's a little slow here. So there is no link in the chat for this uh, comment. Where am I supposed to find it? You go to menti.com. I'm just about to put the slides in and then there's a link on the slides as well. Free 
free PD options. Great. Oops. Some, some technology things that are working for us. What is the six digit uh, code, please? Nine, six, seven, eight, zero, seven. And it's in the chat. I just added it again. Mm, more access for CTE. Checking in the students. If we like Zoom. <laughs> Jen, is there any way to make your screen full screen? better? That's great. Great. Side question, is Mentee free? Yes, it is. Thank you. And they have lots of different options, a little bit like Poll Everywhere, but there are different options on the formatting that you can use for it. Really cool, thank you. No problem. We're seeing lots of technology things. I think as an educational system, we've certainly had accelerated on the job technology training, um, like it or not. So I think we've all, I know I have definitely improved my skills around technology. Great. All right, so now let's move into next question. I can do this right. So what are your questions or concerns about grading right now in this distance learning environment? And we'll capture some of these to address in the Q&A. Formative assessment, indeed. Since I can't see any of the comments on my screen, I'm wondering if everybody's on and if they're participating and putting the input in there and somebody's seeing it. How to keep up with giving constructive and timely feedback to students in a virtual model. Good, you can see it, that's good, okay. Mm -hmm. We don't know who's doing the assessments at home. Having students reflect knowledge and not compliance. How to do formative assessment without parental help at home. Ah, I grading see an opportunity. Yeah. yeah, grading practices that promote rigor and are equitable. Equity. Mm -hmm. Lots of comments about equity. Too many students not engaging through distance learning at all. 
how to measure credit, no credit. Mm -hmm. Too much grading. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lots about formative assessments. Great. So hopefully we will be able to address some of these questions in the presentation and then definitely during the Q&A portion. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Marty to talk about questions that guide PLC work. Are we back to the slides? The uh, questions that guide PLC work are up. The four questions with the fifth question that's added. Why don't I see those on my screen? Do people yeah. see those on their screens? Can everybody see the questions that guide PLC work slide? Yes. Thumbs yeah. up. Why don't I? I'm not sure. <laughs> huh. Do you want me to read them? No, I know the questions. That's okay. <laughs> I knew that you so, did. <laughs> we believe strongly that a conversation about grading that's not tied directly to quality teaching and learning is not a valuable activity. We also know that grading is a very controversial topic. And over time, administrators have taken on the top of, of, of looking at the grading policy in their districts or at their school and more often than not pulled back because of the pushback they get. So it's important that this is in a context that makes sense. And we've had a very unique opportunity this spring to rethink how we teach and how students learn. And so if we look at the, the famous four PLC questions, the first one is, what do we want all students to understand, know, and be able to do? Teachers have had a real chance to, to get out of coverage mode and really rethink what's important that they're teaching. And if they haven't taken advantage of that this spring, hopefully a lot of you will help them take advantage of that in the fall, given that we'll probably still be doing a lot of distance learning and they should be doing it in their classroom all the time anyway. The second question, how are we gonna know if they've learned it or not? I'll tell you, as a high school principal, that was probably the main question I asked teachers all the time when I was in classrooms observing. You know, you've given the information to students, you've watched them do some interaction, but how do you know if they really got it or not? When students walk out the door and they've got some homework to do, think about the large number of them, don't turn it in, do they not turn it because they don't do homework? Or more likely, based on hundreds of interviews I've done with students over the years, they get home and they don't know how to do it. So how do you go about doing formative assessments minute by minute, second by second in the classroom, informals a lot of the time that, that students get it. And it's harder with distance, except for people that have really mastered Zoom and other things like that. There are ways to do small group and do some checking for understanding. It's imperative that they do that. And then three, what do you do for those who haven't gotten it? And that's the reteaching pieces and the, the re-engagement pieces that, um, we need to do a much better job at in, in the classroom. It's not about interventions outside the classroom, although that can support it. It's about teachers figuring out how to differentiate instruction in the classroom and how to use technology to do that, whether they're in their classroom with students or whether they're doing over distance learning. And then what do you do to extend the learning for those who did get it? And then we add the fifth question, which is how do you report out student learning? The grading becomes the fifth question, not the first question. And my fear is from a lot of conversations this spring, people very quickly moved to that fifth question about how are we gonna report this? And some districts said, we're still gonna grade. And other districts said, we're going pass fail. And many districts said, if, um, uh, if uh, the, whatever you do between now and the end of the school year student, it won't lower your grade. So why are we surprised when one of the questions is, too many students are not actively engaging you know, if I, when I was in high school, I would probably have said, well, I better continue with my math because I might need those math skills next year. But I don't want to read that extra English book and write those papers. I've got an A in the class already. I'm done with English. 
I'll just take my A and go home. So we need to look carefully at, again, what's important for students to know and understand be able to do. How we know if they can do it. What we're going to do to really intervene for those who, to reteach and re-engage those who didn't get it and extend those who did, and then figure out how to report that in a useful way. So that's the framework for us about how we look at, at grading. Back to Jen. You're, you're muted. You're muted, Jen. Sorry, but if we believe that student lo students learn in different ways and in different time frames, giving our current context of, you know, we're in the midst of the pandemic, <clears throat> we're in the midst of large scale social unrest. Um, and so that's bringing up probably <clears throat> some trauma for our students. And that time frame piece is going to be really important. Um, how do we ensure that students are not penalized grade-wise if in the current situation they are not quite ready to engage at this moment in time in demonstrating understanding or demonstrating um, learning? How do we encourage systems of grading that honor that? Um, how do we encourage our teachers to focus on the SL SLE needs of our students, which are really significant right now? So how do we encourage teachers in a blended learning environment, and particularly when we start next school year, where you may be as a high school student getting, or a high school teacher getting um, 150 new students that you may not be in the same room with. So how, as structures, are we encouraging our teachers to focus on that SLE learning? And then how is the system, are we encouraging that focus on um, social emotional learning? And I'm actually going to call on one of our colleagues here from San Lorenzo Valley Unified, Ned Hearn, because they developed a rather innovative way to help address the SLE needs of our students. So Ned, if you can come on up and unmute yourself and share a little bit how you engaged your counselors in this work. Oh, are you talking about our Monday specials? Yeah. Okay, so what we did, um, I'm going to turn my video back on because I'm not walking around the house. Um, what we did was we, uh, we put into place a protocol. We had these specialists that um, focus on social emotional learning and, uh, and our mental health counselors. And we kind of put, pulled that team together and we wanted to give our um, regular classroom teachers time to collaborate and plan for the week. So Mondays, we moved away from traditional uh, content, uh, department specific content or uh, English or what have you. And our social emotional and academic counselors and career counseling uh, folk and mental health specialists put together a, a bunch of lessons that uh, were, they prepared ahead of time and provided to the teachers to put into their Google Classroom or put in their Schoology. And we were initially kind of concerned that kids might not sign up and actually participate in those Monday specials as we called them um, because they weren't really for a grade or anything like that but at the high school we had over 93 percent of the kids uh, sign in and participate in the discussion threads and complete the activities and I think it was in the low to mid 80s Terry could probably chime in for the, the middle school um, and then the elementary school had really good participation rates too. So it was nice to, sh nice to see that we could support their social emotional needs, uh, provide lessons that would allow the class, regular classroom teachers to have some time to plan and that the families and the kids were engaging in those lessons um, at, at higher levels than we actually thought. And that was a way that we could kind of support the kids through this time. Um, and, and the discussion threads were pretty interesting to look at and the, the dis social emotional counselors, mental health counselors and, and academic uh, counselors would go in and respond to kids in those discussion threads or respond to the things they submitted for what they did that day in those lessons and um, gave them feedback. And, and it was the, the enrollment and the participation stayed up through the end of the year, which was really nice to see. 
Awesome. Thanks for that, Ned. And I just sure. I just randomly called on him. So I really appreciate you just stepping up and, no and sharing that, that innovative practice. Um, so that's one way that a, a whole system helped address the social emotional needs of their students. But again, I think as leaders, we really need to think about making sure that we aren't penalizing students grade-wise if they're not ready to engage in the very moment that we are maybe giving an assessment or asking them to engage, um, giving them that flexible time frame to demonstrate their understanding. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Marty to look at some recommendations from experts. So if any of you have done some research about grading, there are a couple of names that have probably come up a lot. Uh, Thomas Gusky being one of those, of course. Many of us from Santa Cruz went down to um, Riverside for their conference on grading this past August, and he was the keynote speaker. We all got his book. And he talks a lot about being that the schools and districts need to be very clear about what the purpose of the grading is. So he says, what information will be communicated in the report card or in grades? Who's the primary audience for this information? And what's the intended goal of the communication or how should the information be, be used? And that requires people at least thinking a little bit differently out of the box about what grading is all about. And um, we hope that we'll have some questions and comments. We're trying to save as much time as we can for interaction here. So the other book that I really like, it's my favorite one on grading, it's called Rethinking Grading by Kathy Vanderott. And she has a lot of lessons learned in here, but one of the key ones is to actively involve your stakeholders. So if you're gonna really work at, at um, looking at the grading practices at your school and at your district, it's important to involve a lot of stakeholders in doing that, including students as well as the parents, so that there's a deep understanding about any changes you're gonna to bring to the grading process. Okay. Jen, should I post the resource folder here? Jen, you're muted again. <laughs> um, so we're going to move into the question and answer. Marty's going to moderate. So drop either questions into the chat or you can use the raise hand button and we'll call on you to, to give your question to the group. So I'm at a little disadvantage here because I'm still, my screen is not the screen you all are seeing. I'm just seeing the, 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 uh, the picture of the, an island in the water someplace. So, and I'm not seeing faces, but I can certainly hear the questions when, when people are called on and ask questions. Okay, cool. And we can read off anything that comes up in the chat. And I can look at chat. Okay. I think maybe while we're waiting, I would just also note that in the last few days and in the last month or two, I've been listening to students speak about their experience with distance learning, mostly secondary students. And um, I think it really resonated with the example that Ned provided because they felt very disconnected because not all of their teachers were connecting with them over Zoom and the social emotional component was, was um, a concern for them as well. And so providing that time for connection with um, school counselors is really important. And there were juniors that were really concerned about applying for college and they didn't, they felt lost. So I think that that's a really great model. I don't know how many of you saw that what was going on in Los Gatos a few months ago, Los Gatos uh, Saratoga High School District, where the superintendent allowed an option for students, and I don't know what, how it was finally resolved, but students could choose pass fail or they could choose a grade. And some students at Los Gatos High School wrote an editorial for the local paper about how in inequitable that could be. That colleges might perceive that if you chose the credit, no credit option, that you weren't a very strong student when you had the option going for a grade and that equity became an issue. And they, they got a lot of pushback. It made Mercury News, as I remember, as well. So the, the decisions you make about how grading should take place hits right at the heart of equity. So here's a question about equity. How do we equitably provide support to all students? 
isn't that at the heart of what we're learning from this? I mean, that's been an issue in our traditional schools forever, that, that students who um, come with lots of resources find it way easier to be successful in school than those who don't. And now we're finding a substantial number of kids don't have equal access to technology, certainly don't have equal access to help at home. And um, we ha have to find ways to differentiate. We're not all students are gonna be on the Zoom at the same time where teachers figure out who they need to talk to at certain times and make sure that that happens and, and to build in a variety of, of uh, support services for students into what we provide. If any, any of you are doing very well at that, here's a good chance to be heard. Well, I just asked that question because I wonder when you conclude all stakeholders, Marty, what about you know, like the parents, like the equitable part of like, if I have a family culture of learning, the way I interact with my kid about getting their work done looks different. And so I often wonder, is there another piece here to support the parents? Is anybody out there doing that right now? I, mean, I agree with Terry that that's important. There are a lot, I mean, you just hear from parents all the time about how much they're now appreciating teachers for the first time ever because they're realizing how hard it is and how little they may be able to help their kids at home. And so what happens for those poor kids and those parents where the, where the support is needed? Or where there's three or four kids who are supposed to be doing distance learning and there's only one computer in the house that's available for them. How do we support that? Anyone out there listening who might have a response to that, that something you're doing that's working well? Well, I can't, I can't claim it's something that I'm doing, but I heard a school yesterday and I thought it was brilliant for students that are stuck, they're kind of stuck in that digital divide. They don't have access to the internet. Um, they were transferring students to bring those kids to school and keep them socially distanced in a multi-purpose room, school cafeteria where they can get Wi-Fi access over Chromebooks. I don't know who was supervising those kids, but um, apparently for that school, it was working well. Do you know where that school is, or that school district is, Aaron? Don't remember offhand now. Okay. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I mean, I know talking with a few of you on, the, on this um, Zoom that, that who I see and talk to somewhat regularly, there are a lot of conversations going on around now about the groups that we know are totally not getting served well. Special day kids, for example. Many of our ELD ones and twos. Kids for whom we've already had interventions at school that are not getting those the same way at home, that we've got to find ways to bring them back into the buildings in the fall to give them any kind of shot at success. I assume most of your districts are at least having those conversations right now, but who needs to be on campus on a regular basis and how is all that going to happen? Mm -hmm. I think, Marty, that um, even in a high-risk situation, if you look at the guidelines that you know have been provided on those three railroad tracks that we've seen a million times oh. through California, even in a high-risk situation, you can have students cohorted in groups of 12 to 1. Um, and so kind of like that cafe model where you have students working, but then you have an adult there to help facilitate. Um, at PCS, we sometimes call those people the homework nannies. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm not here to teach you content. Instead, my job is to help you make a plan for getting your work done, you know, encourage you to take healthy breaks and then get back to work, right? Um, so kind of thinking about particularly if we're in a high risk model, we can't bring students to school or even if we're in a medium risk, bringing some students to school more frequently in order to provide them kind of, particularly kids who have executive functioning issues and can't really plan on their own. Um, I think that that's something that we need to be advocating for in whatever structure we go back into next year. Right, right. Is anybody out there doing that very well now, supplying extra support for kids and families apart from the teaching part, but the the social emotional learning support that's needed like that on a regular basis? It's funny because I can tell you we, um, so we're a little bit different. We're not a comprehensive program. We're an independent hybrid in, independent study model. And so, you know, a kid comes from for their one hour meeting weekly and then they have their hybrid uh, class for whatever class they feel they need the greatest level of uh, instruction, direct instruction. 
But when we had to step away and send everybody home, we expected our teachers to still maintain their one hour weekly appointments with kids just doing it over distance over zoom or FaceTime or whatever medium they could to connect with kids first and foremost for socio emotional uh, for social emotional concerns, you know, how is your family doing and how are you doing and that kind of stuff. And so we did call logs. And then in a recent conversation with a, one of my teachers, I went through the call logs with him. And I was really disappointed to see how many times the colleague didn't catch up with um, our student, the student that he was responsible for. And so I think we have to do a better job of drilling down to monitor that. If we're going to ask it to be done, we have to do a better job of monitoring that. I've got another question here that I think is, um, will address some of the larger concepts in grading for the fall. What types of assessments should we use to measure student progress and report grades on a report card, both for K-5 standards based grading and for six, eight traditional letter grades? Um, there's some concern that the credit, no credit component isn't feasible again for reopening in the fall. If we define grading as a, a way of reporting out what students have learned, are learning to show what they have learned, what they understand and know how to do, then it's, we've got to agree that it isn't something that is specifically time specific, that every student has to demonstrate it by a Friday on, on one test, or that over the course of the, the semester or school year, that every assignment counts exactly the same as opposed to assignments later on counting more because it's demonstrating over time the students have learned more and more. And so the kind of assessments we use, whether they're objective assessments or more, more subjective, have got to be ones that allow students a chance to demonstrate over time their mastery. And that's a major change in, in, um, in how teachers look at student learning. I mean, many, many teachers would say, I can't, it's too much work to make up two or three exams for each time I give something for makeups and all that. And then students will use the first one as a practice test so they can do better the next time around. I mean, you know, most of us have seen teachers try a variety of ways of doing that. But we've got to recognize that not all students learn in the same way at the same speed. And we've got to find ways to differentiate to support that. Now, I don't have a sense here how many people we have who are elementary or middle or high school. But I'm looking at the, at the uh, chat, and there's a relevant uh, comment there that's from, uh, from Jamie Kay to everyone about in her English department, we've tried to stop using A, B, C, D, and F. We talk about the, their work is exceeding, meeting, approaching, and does not meet standards. And then the whole issue about the role letter grades play. So the team that I put together, I don't know, about 20 years ago to do um, date work when date was the big thing supporting schools that were low performing and we were not going to go in as the stopwatch police but we we're going in um, using a lot of Doug Reeves work and, and uh, about power standards particularly at the elementary level where teachers are much more comfortable looking at standards-based learning we had quite a few teachers around in five different school districts that were using the exceeding meeting approaching does not meet standards and telling students that they had a, a period of time, a lengthy period of time, to get to the place where they're meeting standards in all areas, and that it was the job of the class, the students, to help each other get to that level. We worked with that at, at a number of middle school, high school, uh, junior high schools, and teachers were open to that concept. It got harder at the high school level, where that whole issue of college admission and grades were overwhelming, and high school teachers were way more resistant to looking at it from that point of view than the particularly elementary, but also some of the middle school people we work with. But it does mean redefining grades, that you can start out where you're approaching standard and it's okay to be approaching standard, as long as a few days later, a few weeks later, you get to meet it. And maybe three quarters of students are meeting standard before the other group, but the other group still has time to get there because it's important. If those are important standards, then it's our job as the educators to get all of our students to the place where the meeting standards. And I think that that model is a good model for teachers to look at and maybe even more useful right now given the distance learning to look at using that as opposed to grades so that there are multiple assessments around that important power standards that the teachers agree that that's what they're teaching to 
Marty and Jen, I wonder if you could speak to um, post-secondary acceptance of standards-based grading. There is concern that, um, especially in high school, standards-based grading wouldn't be um, viable considering the post-secondary acceptance of those grades. Um, so the, the last place that I worked um, outside of the county office, DCP, we had a full standards-based, uh, in high school, had full standards-based grading. We converted from the four-point proficiency scales to a letter grade. Um, Ninety-some-odd percent of our students were accepted to four-year universities out of that school, so it was not a concern, really, as long as we had translated into the traditional grading. We didn't do that for students. We did it at the very end when it was time to do transcripts, so it wasn't really an issue for us. And there have been times when um, the UC system has been willing to sit down with groups of high schools and look at, from comprehensive high schools, to look at alternative transcript models that they're willing to use and accept students off of. So I remember um, a number of years ago, Homestead High School up in Cupertino was part of a group of about a dozen high schools that were negotiating with the UC system to use, um, to use an alternate kind of transcript for admission. And the, the UC system was very open to working with them on that. That's a, that's a place where you've really got to engage all your stakeholders, as Kathy Vanderrott says, because parents can be very, very uncomfortable with moving away from the traditional letter grades. And so a number of schools that have gone to some other system, as Jen just said, ha have a system in place to translate that back into grades. And um, Augusti talks about that in his book. There are schools that he, he has worked with that have done it that way. Maybe could you talk a little bit more about the parent communication and the, um, how essential that is? Um, most of the experts who talk about grading say that parental communication around what you're doing and the shift in grading is one of the most important components. If you work in a school district where you've got a fairly powerful parent population and actively engage parents with your school board, if you don't actively involve those parents in this conversation, superintendents will lose their jobs because parents will get very upset and they'll lobby school board members and board meetings will become very contentious. So it's critically important from the political point of view, apart from just the right thing to do, to actively engage your parents. And a part of that then has to be bringing in the university folks to talk about their will and prepare them for that, to talk about their willingness to look at some alternative systems or to look at some schools that have used some alternative systems and translated it back into grades so that parents can feel comfortable that this can work. Otherwise, they'll bring the system down. And a few of the books on grading are filled with case studies where the parent community was ignored and things fell apart and they had to back off from their grading, um, the grading changes they're talking about making. And Marty, I would add to you that your teachers unions are probably another critical stakeholder yes. group that you'll need to engage um, if you'd like to, to move forward. Yep. And I want to speak to that because I've worked with some school districts on their grading policies and the union was represented at the work. But just because they have some people as part of the committee that are from the union doesn't mean that they're necessarily talking with the troops when they're not at the meetings. So when agreement is reached and the, the union reps who are there strongly support what comes out and they get pushed back when they go back to their school sites, doesn't necessarily mean that they will defend what they did. So being very strategic, this is, you know, this is a very contentious political issue if you're gonna change the way you're grading. And yet, if we really wanna value student learning and particularly around the equity issues, we've gotta stop saying that the only students we really value at the school are the ones who pass the test on Friday after I've lectured at them for the first four days of the week. Because we know that a lot of our students are not successful in that model. We've gotta change that model. 
So perhaps we could also talk about, there were some questions around whether or not we should be monitoring or grading students about their participation in Zoom during distance learning, which I think also relates to just the general aspects of grading, including some social behavior and whether or not that should be included in the grade. Did I? I stumped no, you no. all, right? <laughs> Most of the experts on grading, and I'm gonna disagree with their position, so I will be somewhat controversial, would say that the grade itself should only reflect what students know. And that there can be an alternate grade that's around habits of work and habits of mind. I assume most of you are familiar with those terms, habits of work and habits of mind. And, um, and that those should be separate. But in reality, nobody out there really cares about a second grade. They're only looking at their grade that demonstrates what students know. And, and I think what most of us here would recognize when we think about the is issues of persistence and that, you know, that educational garb, um, term that's being used a lot now about having grit, the students who are successful when they leave high school, oftentimes are the ones who are really persistent and have grit and have good study habits. More than sometimes, this, so it's not always the one who uh, was that brilliant kid in class, but it's the ones who work hard. And at some point we need to recognize it, but not as we do too often now, where teachers in too many schools grade on whether a kid brings a pencil to class or whether they do their homework every day, even though they're getting A's on their tests. And, um, how much they participate when you've got some shy kids in class who may not raise their hand as often or respond when they're called on the same kind of way. And so if we're going to count habits of work and habits of grade as part of the overall grade, then we've got to have some rubrics in place that are more objective so that it's really clear what we're looking at. And I don't know if we have any representatives out here from the new tech, the new tech network, but the new tech network, it's about 250 schools around the country that do a lot of project-based learning. Um, Terry's in there, he was at the middle school in Seaside, there was a new tech affiliated school. They've got some very good rubrics for that that I know are being used. Bulldog Tech over in Evergreen School District, or middle school in Evergreen School District, has been using that, and I think quite successfully, reinforcing as part of the grade, students' work habits, but in a pretty objective way so the students know exactly what's expected of them. So we've got just, we've got about six minutes left. I don't know um, if you wanted to move into what people felt their, their next steps would be. That's probably a good idea, yes. Are we doing that here on? Uh... So I think that people could just enter into the chat what, you know, one thing that you feel that you're going to do as a result, I mean, in relation to grading practices. And maybe people could raise their hand or even unmute and share. Well, I see Terry's there, but we need to define attendance, participation, grading requirements. I mean, that's kind of what I'm talking about is having some rubrics in place that really clearly define what those words mean. So there's not students wondering how in the world, you know, how does that count in there? If I bring extra Kleenex to the classroom for extra points, do I get a higher grade than if I don't? That's not a very, that's not about habits of work and habits of mind or demonstrating of learning. Well, it's very good. Would be that the, the reason why we need to do grading is the hold harmless thing generated apathy unnecessarily. And so if we're gonna give grades, then the question to me becomes, how do we do it in a way that it's, it's fair, uh, but we still keep score? And... I think if any of you spend time interviewing your students, what you find is that, and it's really an equity issue, the students who do well in school know how to play the game. And many other kids just don't get it. They just can't figure it out. They can't figure out their teachers. And they can't figure out what the rules are exactly. And they're not anywhere near as successful. And that's all about equity. And it is about being clear what's important here. And it is about clearly defining what the grade means and where it comes from and ways that are equitable. 
And you got to involve a lot of stakeholders in doing that. The students ought to be part of putting that together. A lot of the teachers ought to be part of putting that together in constructive ways. This, thanks, Marty. This gave me a, a lot to think about. Um, in particular, I've, I've been a strong advocate throughout this time of, of making sure that students can demonstrate their learning, even after we've passed that test in class, that kids can go back and, and, uh, and demonstrate their mastery of that subject later on. Um, but, it, you know, it's always interesting, you know, just as a, I'm also a classroom teacher and I've had shy students tell me, thank you for requiring me to talk and having a certain amount of time that I have to actually talk in class in order to get a good participation grade because your class is the only class that I talk in because you, you keep track and you make sure that every single kid talks in class every single day, right? And so... <clears throat> So I'm torn about that, right? I mean, I understand I don't want to penalize students or give kids who are shy a, a lower grade. On the other hand, you know, sometimes kids need a push. And how do you give that push when you're also dealing with 150 kids, you know, in a day, right? That's a, that's a great, great question. I mean, you know, people have made lots of money off of leading professional development about how to ask questions in the classroom. And it's an art form to do it well. It's a real art form to do it well. And for those people who are good at it, who actively, act, actively can engage a wide variety of voices. It doesn't have to always be in front of the whole class. You know, there's lots of ways to get students to speak in smaller groups where you as the teacher can hear it, encourage it, and extend it. Right. I mean, I can, I can say that universally, I generally get students to, to talk in small groups, but how do we, I mean, I feel like it's important for students to learn to use their voice out loud in crowds. Like that's yes. something that we need to, right. it's yeah. a skill that need, it's, it's not just compliance. It's a skill that needs to be taught to, to raise your voice and have yourself be heard, right? Yeah, and I think it's critical to have for those sort of grit-based skills to have in the beginning of the year that scale or that rubric laid out so students over the course of the year can see how they can demonstrate mastery of that particular skill. So maybe at the beginning they're a, a one or a not yet on that skill, but they see the pathway of how they can become proficient at that skill and that we don't penalize them if it takes that shy kid half a semester to get to the place where they can engage with the whole class and speak. So I think just being super upfront about this is a skill that we're going to work on this year and here's how you get there and I'm not going to cause harm to you because you're shy and it takes you a little bit longer. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, I long to be in classrooms, secondary classrooms, because this already happens a lot in elementary classrooms. I long to be in secondary classrooms where teachers have a guided reading table in their room and they pull kids up in groups of four or five as other students are engaged in the work in the classroom and they do it strategically. So as an old high school math teacher, I knew that there were some kids in there that if I didn't get them to get their piece of paper out and put their name on the top and get ready to do some writing in class, it could take them a whole hour just to find a piece of paper in their backpack. So if I get them started strategically, that would make sense. And I would say the same thing about students who are not speaking up a lot of times in class. You could pull them up and say, look, I, I know you know this stuff. I need you to speak up more. Let's practice that here. Let's just take a few minutes to practice that here. And when I work with teachers and I say, you never need to pull that group of kids together for more than seven minutes. Send them back, pull up another group of kids, circulate, whatever. And I think strategically how we work with students in small groups in a classroom is critically important. And with 150 kids, even more so, of knowing who you need to pull together and small groups are part of a class and work with them carefully. And it can be on some of those kind of skills, not just the academic side. So we are at our time limit. I think I just posted a resource folder in the chat. Um, and I believe that they'll be making the slide deck available and I can um, include the resource folder as well. If we've got a couple minutes in between sessions, if anybody wants to stay on and continue to talk and otherwise, I would just say thank you for attending. Enjoy the conference and, and enjoy your summer. <laughs>